Okay, hi, this is the, my name's Ken Cousin. This is the introduction to Android development for Gradle Talk. The purpose of this talk is to talk a little bit about how Android development is done at the moment and how it's going to be done in the future based on the new Gradle build tool. I want to talk about Gradle, which you can use from the command line if you prefer. That's one of the nice features about it. I also want to use it inside the new IDE inside of Android Studio. Eclipse has some Gradle capabilities, but well, virtually none worth speaking about. There's a few. And in Eclipse, you can generate a Gradle build file, and yet I'm going to show that. And yet, the normal mechanism now is you don't even have to do that. You can go ahead and import Eclipse projects right into Android Studio and start working from there. Google has claimed that they are going to support both IDEs for the foreseeable future. Frankly, I don't really believe them. <laughs> Uh, I imagine they're not going to deprecate the Eclipse ADT tools. I don't think they're going to tell you not to use it. But I expect that most future development will be on the Android Studio side uh, involving the Android plugin, you know, and, and the Gradle plugin rather. And I think that's, uh, in the long run, a very good thing for us. The difference between Android Studio, by the way, and Eclipse, of course, is that Android Studio is based on IntelliJ IDEA rather than based on anything Eclipse. Uh, any Eclipse Foundation. And while An IntelliJ IDEA is a commercial tool, Android Studio is free. So that this is their attempt to give something to the community that you can use in a practical sense. And there's all kinds of capabilities associated with this. So all right, just a couple of slides and then I'll dive in. I want to dive into the code stuff. I'd rather spend time on the code aspects here. Uh, again, there's my, my name, my um, email address, ken.cousin at cousinit.com. I say cousin IT, my wife says cousin it, like the Adams family. Yeah. It was her idea. Uh, there's my Twitter handle. There's the book that has almost but not quite nothing to do with this talk at all. Um, I mean, I do talk about Gradle in the book, but of course now I want to talk about Android. There's nothing like that. I am currently working with both the Gradle people and I'm um, with Gradleware and with uh, uh, Xavier, uh, let's see if I say it right, Ducrohe. Is that close? Close. Uh, on a, another book for O'Reilly that's part of their Gradle series. They have a couple of short and sweet books. They're like 100 pages each. This will be another one in the series specifically discussing this Android plugin for Gradle. OK, now, if you've never worked with Android before, the home page for everything is developer.android.com. Now, let me show you. I already have. OK, the resolution here is going to be very different, so let me just magnify things a bit. Uh, I want to go to that website here. So there's developer.android.com. And of course, they have a lot of marketing stuff and everything. But if you go to the develop section, and then there are a series of sections on the various features of Android apps. This reference section is where you have your Java docs, leaving aside the fact of whether Android is actually Java or not, you know, we'll ignore that for the moment. There's a section on tools as well that talks about all these different pieces. And in this tools section, you see they say right here, oops, sorry about that. Uh, magnify is what I wanted to do. The Android developer tools plugin for Eclipse is how they go ahead and build. And write applications now. Now I gotta say, for all of Eclipse's failings, I've, I've been using it since I don't know 2001, 2002. You know, very early on, I feel that this plugin is actually in many ways a better Eclipse than Eclipse. It seems very stable. It does excellent on Code Assist. It's really a nice, nice job. It's just there's only so far you can take it. You know, that's that's kind of the problem. There's only so much you can do. And as Eclipse keeps growing and getting somewhat less stable over time. Uh, they found a way to start working with IntelliJ IDEA, and I think you'll see that that's really slick. Now, if you were to download the JDK, or the SDK as they call it here, you'll see that they put in a bundle of Eclipse plus this plugin, as well as tools that are associated with Android development, and platform tools, and the latest versions, including an emulator. And it's all a bundle that uh, includes the, their Eclipse version inside it. And in fact, I do have one of those running. Uh, this is, let me make it full screen here. You can see up here, very small, like my little magnifier there. That cost me a dollar. You know, you know, 99 cents plus one cents at the Apple store. I'm like, okay, whatever. You, know. uh, you see how it says ADT here? 
That's the Android Developer Tools plugin for Eclipse. Now, I used the bundle, so I downloaded the whole thing. You can add it to an existing Eclipse version if you want. I prefer to keep them separate just because it's a very invasive bundle, it's a plugin. It's hard to, it, it may, you know, get in your way when you're dealing with other projects and things like that. So I'm just going to uh, leave it as is. Now, back to the, to the, uh, image here, or back to the web page, they do say there's Android Studio Early Access Preview. And if you go to that link, then they show you the whole new environment. And if you're already an IntelliJ IDEA person, you'll go, oh, wow, that's very familiar. No problem at all. Very comfortable with it. it ha and the beauty of it is, of course, everything is based on Gradle in there. So unlike Eclipse, where if you use Gradle at all, it's just to refresh the project and then you use the tools inside Eclipse to do everything else. Here, every time you're executing some sort of task, it's actually invoking the Gradle task on your build file. So we'll need to see what that build file looks like as well. So there is a download here. It says 0.5.2, and that I got to mention, when they use a version number like that, they're not kidding. Okay. This is not one of those, oh yeah, Gmail's in beta for 20 years kind of thing. No, no, no. This is very early access. Now that said, it has improved by leaps and bounds over the last six months to a year. A year ago, I would have said, you can download it and you can try it out, but there are a lot of missing features and there's, there's arguably a fair number of bugs. I'd say at this point, especially just, just this week, they released version 0.6. It's actually pretty stable, and I do know some clients who are using it on an active, regular basis for all of their Android development. So they've done very well with it. So question? Yeah, I think it happened. What, what version did you switch over on? Rob, 0 0.4 or something like that? 5, yeah. Somewhere in the 0.4s, it suddenly got to the point where it crossed the threshold of, no, no, this is really helping me, rather than being a problem. And 0.6, the biggest thing they just changed is to make it much more compatible with the Gradle daemon. So if you're using Gradle and you have your daemon property set correctly in your root uh, like that, now Gradle is taking advantage of that daemon and that helps the performance, or rather Android Studio is taking advantage of that Gradle daemon and that helps performance enormously. You know, that's made a big, big difference on this. So even if you downloaded 0.5.2, be sure to upgrade to the 0.6 version. Yes, sir. I wish I knew. The question was, is why doesn't this already have 0.6 on the web page? And I can only assume that it's the people who are in charge of the web page are not the people in charge of developing the product, you know? And uh, sometimes it's still a large bureaucracy. I imagine they'll update it at some point. So it's actually a small matter of, uh, you know, it's supposed to be a traverse thing Okay, so for the video. Yeah. So for the video, Zav's saying that the web page is supposed to have a stable version, and therefore they don't update it every time the Android Studio version updates, and 0 0.6.1 should be pretty stable and therefore show up there. But it's easy enough to go ahead and do the upgrade. You know, but I, I agree with you. I would have hoped that it would be there at some point. Uh, they do have it everywhere else, but you could do the check updates and everything. Uh, now, how do you build a Gradle application, or rather, pardon me, how do you build an Android application? Well, here's the Eclipse approach. And if I say I want to do a new Android application project, then I get a wizard here that you can see has an application name, a project name, package name, and then these important factors like the minimum required SDK and the target SDK. Now, the application name is what shows up in the Google Play Store. So I can put spaces in that. I can say, hello, Gradle, Summit, for example. And you'll see here that it shows up with spaces, but when they convert it to the name of the project inside of Eclipse, they take the spaces out. And then for the package name, they start off with com.example, and then they append that on the end. Android Studio will be slightly different, which I'll show you in a moment. Now, com.example is the package that is used for all of the Google samples. So while you can, in principle, write an app in there, you can't deploy anything from that. You can't 
deploy that to the Google Play Store. Uh, only once in a while will I accidentally forget and try to upload something to the Google Play Store and it'll go, you know, you can't do that with com.example. Now I say it's very nicely done. If I tab over to this, you can see that when I tab in, it immediately highlights that part of the package. So I could change it here to uh, com. And I, was, I normally say NFJS, but I'll say uh, GS for Gradle Summit. And then I have to choose these SDK versions. Now the SDK for Android is designated by a couple different ways. One is there's a traditional version number, like 2.3 or 4.0 or what have you. One is that there's a version number. They started at 1 and they're currently up to 19. These are just integers they work their way through. And then another is that they have an actual name. That's the one you hear in the press, like ice cream sandwich or jelly bean or Kit Kat, that sort of thing. Those are all desserts. Uh, they started alphabetically from cupcake. I don't know what happened to A and B, but cupcake was C, and then donut, eclair, froyo is frozen yogurt, gingerbread, honeycomb, which was around just for a few months. That was the first tablet operating system, added in fragments and uh, action bars and things like that. Then ice cream sandwich, jelly bean, and then everybody thought it was going to be key lime pie. And uh, from what I understand, the story I heard, you know, and I don't work for Google or Gradleware, so I can tell you what I think, okay? <laughs> but at any rate, the story I heard is that internally in Google, they'd been referring to this thing as KitKat for a while, but of course that's a commercial product. So they had to contact Nestle, and they contacted him and said, hey, we want to use the name. And it's something I find amazing. A major company the side of Nestle took like less than half an hour to go, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I mean, no money exchange hands, and they said, absolutely, go for this. So at any rate, that one is, is KitKat. I have no idea what L will be. I imagine we'll find out at Google I.O., which is next week, the week after. It's this month. It's coming up very soon. All right, at any rate, the key is that you would like to pick something at least as old, you know, at least in the 4.0s if you can, because the programming model changed in Ice Cream Sandwich. You know, it changed in Honeycomb, really, but there aren't any Honeycomb devices in, in the market anymore, really. So it's better to use the 4.0 or above if you can get away with that. The number of gingerbread and earlier devices in the marketplace right now is roughly 15%, and that's been dropping by about a percent or two every month. They have dashboards at Android which will show you that and show you the marketplace. So I'm going to pick 15 here for the, the most common version of Ice Cream Sandwich. Now for the Target SDK, you, that's the one that you are guaranteeing you've tested this app out on. And I'll just pick the latest. And Compile With, you always pick the latest. Because Compile With is just the latest version of the compiler. It has all the bug fixes and everything. And it's always backward compatible. It doesn't mean that you're restricting your app to that. You're, you can use your app at all the way down to the minimum SDK as long as you use the latest compiler. The theme I'm picking is Hololite with Dark Action Bar, which will be clear when I show it to you. Uh, I'm not going to create a custom launcher icon. I am going to create an activity. Now, part of the challenge, if you're a Java developer, of learning Android is that the words they use don't necessarily correspond to what you expect them to correspond to. Okay, you, if you've ever done a GUI toolkit implementation, if you've ever worked with GUI toolkits like Swing or even HTML, something like that, you know we have layout managers and then we have components and we lay them out and we trigger events and all of that. Well, here the term activity means a single screen on an Android application. And if you have multiple screens, you'll have multiple activities. And the one activity will be the so-called launcher activity, the one that gets triggered when you fire up the app on your device. Now, not every app needs an activity. Perhaps you've some, you know, if you've installed like a weather widget, just dragged it onto your screen, that doesn't require a launcher activity. It does have an activity, but not a launcher. I'm going to put in the traditional activity, the standard here. Uh, this puts it in the workspace. And when I click Next here, I have a choice of a blank activity an empty activity, full screen, and a master detail flow. And they're showing all these different possibilities. Since I'm not going to stay in Eclipse longer than just showing you what the layout is, uh, I'll stick with the empty activity, the minimum possible one. And by the way, there's the theme, holo light with dark action bar. The action bar is the thing along the top that you can use for a menuing system. So when I click Next here, then you see that they give the, name, the activity a name, and it defaulted to main, but you could put in whatever you want. And then it says layout name, and 
Android uses XML for the layout. Now that's the static layout that you start with. You can dynamically change it. You can write code and modify the layout any way you like. And you can use fragments where you swap in and out different layouts. But you have to start with something so that it knows what to render when you first access that screen. They use a reverse underscore mechanism. So if I'd made this like my main activity, you see how it throws that in with underscores and all uh, lowercase. So if I'm going to use that, I just hit finish. And let me, because of the, the screen size here, let me change my font. And I'll make it you know, as big as I can manage here. So how about uh, that size? Is that readable? OK, so what you see is over here I have a couple of things. First of all, there's the project. Here's a source folder. And inside the source folder is my package. And inside the package is my main activity, which I have over here. It extends a class called activity and has a series of callback methods in it. Since I picked an empty activity, there's only one on create. But there is on stop, on start, on pause, on resume. There's a whole series of these life cycle methods that you can take advantage of for your application. So that when someone hits the back button, it triggers on stop, and you can go ahead and do something. And when they go back to it, it goes through on create again, or rather on resume, and then you can reacquire whatever resources you need, that sort of thing. Now, in addition to that, here's the XML. Now, they have it in a graphical layout, if I want to see it, where they're showing the picture as well as a Hello World string, this tiny little string in here. But if I look at it in XML view, you can see this is a relative layout with a text view. There's another term that doesn't fit what our mental model is. They should have called it label. I mean, that's what they call it in HTML. And in Swing, we call it JLabel. Here it's called a text view. It's an unmodifiable label, if you will. Although you can modify it programmatically. But it's not something the user can edit. Every component, and I call them components sometimes, the true term is widget. Every widget in Android you has a layout width and a layout height. And they're restricted to either wrap the content they're in or match whatever the parent size is as well. And then here we see one of the layers of indirection. When I say what text is on this, it says at string, hello world. And this is using a string resource. See the res folder here? So under res, there's a series of drawable folders. There's the layout folder with this XML. Here's several folders with the word values in it. If I open this up, you'll see here's values strings.xml. Let me go to the text view. And there's your hello world inside here. So again, it's just a layer of indirection. The at sign here is a reference to a string resource whose name is hello world. And then you just follow that. Now what I can do in here is I can say, just to show you how nice the control space capability is, is that if I want to say, let's make the text size bigger, control space doesn't force me to put in Android colon. So I could say, oh, let's make the text size 24 control space. And there's all the different sizes, pixels, inches, millimeters, points, and then dips and sips. <laughs> DP is device independent or density independent pixels. They're normalized to 160 dots per inch. And then SP is scale independent pixels, which really you just use for text because it follows the user's preferences for fonts. Since this is text, I'll put in SP. And when I save that, if I go back to the graphical layout, now it's larger. See? Now you can edit from the graphical layout. You can edit from the XML. You can do whatever you like. And then, of course, in the main activity, they are setting the content view to be this. And wait a minute, what's this R thing? Okay. Well, the XML is not, in fact, loaded on the device. The XML files, whether they be layout files or other, are all compiled and then made available to code in the form of a generated class called R. If I look at this R class, at the top they say, don't modify this, <laughs> generate it automatically. You see this is a public final class with a bunch of public final classes in it. And one of them is this string. That's from that string collection there. And then each of those names, app name and hello world, assigned some, is assigned some hex value. So again, layer after layer of indirection. That's why we keep the apps really simple so that we can focus on the technology part that we want.
Okay, so there's the loading of that activity main layout. And as you saw, if I ran this, it would display hello world. Now, in order to run it, I have to do a couple things here. First of all, I didn't show you the actual SDK manager. Now, there's a button in here to do it, but let me show you. I don't really need the button. Uh, let's see. I'm going to make this font much bigger here. Clear. If I just say Android after downloading the toolkit, I've set a hand Android home variable and put the bin folder in my path. Frankly, I'm on a Mac, so I used a homebrew install of the Android SDK, uh, but you could do it either way. You see that there's a section of tools here for the SDK tools, the platform tools, and then build tools for each major version or each going all the way back. Then there are dedicated sections to individual Android versions like uh, 19, 18, 17. Each one has like documentation and samples and various other pieces. Apparently the, Google, the Glass development kit is ready to update. I, don't, I think maybe I'll skip that in this presentation. You know. uh, and I've got, I'm just somebody, I like to kind of install everything. Uh, so I've installed pretty much everything. Under the extras, you have all your Google services including Google Play services with, with your billing library as well. And I have this thing called a, an Intel x86 emulator acceleration, HaxM, which speeds up the emulator by a huge amount. So this is how you can add older SDKs to your system, and it keeps track of them and lets you update them as well. Now, if I want to run this, I also need to run on an emulator, and that's a different button. These are called AVDs, Android Virtual Devices. These are just settings corresponding to various devices in practice. They're, don't think of it as formally emulating those devices. It's just screen size and resolution and things of that nature. I've made a handful of them. Let me pick this one that I know is working. I based it off of this Intel Atom chip, and that will start the HackSem accelerator, which will make this thing fire up about 10 times as fast as the normal ARM chip will. Uh, in reality, what I also plan to do a little bit later is I have a, my Note 3 here. I'm going to plug this in as a connected device also. In order to run anything, including tests, you have to have either an emulator or a connected device or both. What I hope to do later, uh, and I'll make it in terms of time, is I want to run a test because one of the really cool features of the Gradle build system is that it runs tests on all connected devices simultaneously. It's running them all in parallel. Now, I have no way to prove that. Okay, I'm not tracking the threads or anything, the processes, but I'll show you that I can run on two emulators and a connected device all at the same time just to show it. This thing started up. I can open up the emulator here, and believe me, even though I don't know how fast that seemed to you, but compared to the regular emulator, that was warp speed. That was really amazing. So let me move this to another screen for the moment. And then I will come back to the Android Studio, I'm sorry, the Eclipse one here. And now, if I wanted to, I can simply run this application uh, by saying run as an Android application. And of course, it's not happy. It figures. Uh, it's Eclipse, you know. Uh, one thing I can do here is one of the things that comes with the Android tools, let me clear again, is something called ADB a command for the Android debug bridge. This allows you to open up a shell on the actual device or on an emulator or whatever. Uh, it has a command called kill server <laughs> to stop it, and then one called start server. I shouldn't have hit tab. Uh, there we go, start server, which will start it up again. And that, see the key is the emulator is actually a completely separate process on the machine. So sometimes Eclipse loses connection with it. So this way, by restarting it, that may make it so that I can go ahead and run again. So if I do my run as an Android application, and now it's launching it, and I should get a prompt. I don't know. I may not have it set that way. Oh, I didn't have it set that way. Normally, it will prompt me to say which device you want to run under. And since I only had one running, and my default must have been set to just go ahead and use it. And there you see, I made an Android application and deployed it. Very exciting, right? Okay, now the thing that to keep in mind about this before I move over to Android Studio is the project layout here. Is that you see, boy, if you could see, um, 
I don't have time to change the resolution on my screen any, so I'll just magnify again, is that you have a source folder, but you don't have your traditional Maven structure, your source main, Java, that sort of thing. That's not there. Plus, under these resource this resource folder, there's a whole series of other folders that have a particular names and, and uh, modifications as well. So there's a standard project layout that has been established from the beginning of the Android development process. And of course, that's not what normal Java development projects are, tip, are accustomed to working with. And Android Studio and Gradle, of course, prefers the standard Maven layout. So some accommodations have to be made. Okay. Now, the last thing I'll do before I leave this is if I right click on the project and I go to the export here, under export, under Android, there are two elements here. One is export an Android application. This is what you use if you want to build the so-called APK, the export, the, the actual application itself that you plan to load in the Google Play Store or give to another user to install. If you want to export the APK, then you trigger another wizard that says, oh, where's your key signer and where's your what password for the, for the key tool and everything. You know, so that would trigger the signing of the jar file. Uh, I call it a jar file, but the term in, in Android is an APK, and that's what you upload to Google Play when somebody is using a device and, I mean, let me, let me rephrase. Say you're doing something internal to the company and you didn't want to deploy everything to Google Play and have everybody go get it there. The easiest way to deploy it to all your coworkers is to put the APK link on a web page internally and have somebody browse to it with their device, because when they click on it, that MIME type triggers Google's installer, the Android installer, which will install, install the app and then you could go use it immediately like that. Well, at any rate, that export wizard will trigger that. The other one, notice, is that there's generate Gradle build file. So this is, not, this is no longer the, the top recommended way to do this, but it knows enough about Gradle that if I select generate Gradle build file and I say next, it says, wait a minute, import instead? Consider importing directly into Android Studio instead of exporting from Eclipse, and which is what you should do now. Android Studio, they're constantly revving and bringing up to date. Now, I'm using what they call the Canary builds. You know, they are coming out roughly once every week or maybe every two weeks. Uh, but that one I know is up to date, whereas the Eclipse ADT doesn't get changed very often at all. Nevertheless, I'll click Next here, and I pick my project is Hello Gradle Summit or hello, yeah, and I say next, and I just say finish, and uh, export successful, choose import project in Android Studio, and browse to the build file, not to the project anymore. Browse to the Gradle build. Now, if you're an IntelliJ person, you're used to doing this. You know, you always browse to the Gradle build file, and IntelliJ takes care of everything else. Although, if you're using an, er uh, an earlier version of IntelliJ, it wasn't as common, but the current one, yeah, we do that all the time. At any rate, I wanted to show you that because here's the actual build file now, and this will be the beginning of our discussion for real, although I'm not going to use this. I want to show you this is actually already a little bit dated, and I'll show you the better one inside of Android Studio. So if you're familiar with Gradle, of course, you've recognized this tag, the build script tag. Build script is basically a way of saying, hey, the plugin I want is not part of the standard Gradle distribution. I can't just say apply plugin Android because the Android plugin is not built into standard Gradle's distribution. Therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to use the build script to download the plugin as well. So this build script section has a repository section that says go find the plugin at Maven Central, and then the dependencies section shows the actual characteristics of the plugin. So if you're a Maven person and you're not a Gradle person, I don't, you know, then welcome first of all, you know, glad to see you. But secondly, <laughs> Uh, this is three sections separated by colons. The first one's the group ID. The second one. The Maven people would call an artifact ID. Here we just call it a name. And then there's your version number, and they actually used a plus in it. So this section here is purely for the plugin itself. Downloads the plugin. If you have additional dependencies for your project, this is not where to add them. Down below will be where to add them. Then I see once they've done that, now I can apply the Gradle plugin here. And then we get stuff that is all based on Android. And I'll talk about this stuff in the other one. What I want to show you is this section here. 
Now, if you're a Gradle person, you're familiar with the term source sets. These are your source folders, if you will, your, your set of source folders. And this is saying source main Java, if you will, is using the source directory SRC. So if you follow that, you can imagine all the rest of these are there to map the normal Eclipse project structure, the regular default Android structure, to the new project structure that they're trying to adopt. So the whole purpose of the source sets here is to go ahead and build, uh, tell Gradle how to map to what it's expecting from the existing structure. Also, you see down here it says instrument test.set root to test. The implication here is that there would be another source folder called tests and that that would be where our instrument tests go. An instrument test is a GUI driven test where we can say find a button and click on it and check to see that something shows up, etc. This is already out of date, as I say. When we go over to the Android Studio one, you'll see that they've already renamed the term instrument test to Android test as of 0 0.10, I believe it was. Everything changed there. Uh, then they have a few other things as well. As I say, I don't want to go into this here. I just wanted to introduce it. Now let me switch to Android Studio and show you what, they, what it looks like over there. Okay? All right. So actually, here's a, an open window over. Ah, here. Right. I already have it open up. Let me say in Android Studio, I want to make a new project. Again, things look pretty much the same, just the, the layout's a little different, except that Android Studio expects to make everything a multi-project build from Gradle. That's one of the first major differences. In Eclipse, it was all a single project. And here was another thing I didn't show. But in Eclipse, if I wanted to test this thing, I'd have to make a separate project called an Android test project, which would then point to my Android project with all the, the Android distribution, all the code in it. See, So we'd have two projects instead of one. In the new project layout, the one inside of Gradle, there is a source Android test Java. Just like we're normally accustomed to source test Java in Maven, in Android Studio or in Android projects, now it'll be source Android test Java, etc. So they're already expecting to have sub-projects inside the main project. Well, they start us off that way by saying, we're going to have an application name, whatever we want to call it, which again, I'll call it uh, Hello Gradle Summit, how about AS on the end, just to distinguish it from the other one for Android Studio. And they already put in a module called App. So we're going to have two Gradle build files, one at the top level, which will also have a settings. Gradle file to say, oh yeah, we're importing the app project. And then we'll have Gradle, uh, build.gradle in the app folder as well, which will have everything else we need. If we want to add a library project later, one of the easy ways to do that is to add it as another module in this project. Now that would be a library that you intended to use locally. You could also make an actual AAR, you know, an R, you know, <laughs> AAR, an Android archive out of your library and publish that to a repository and use that as a dependency elsewhere. So you have lots of options here, but it defaults to assuming we're doing a multi-project build. So there's the term app as the module name. The package name, they're using something that I used last time. So let me change that to uh, com.gs for Gradle Summit. And then the rest of it, again, it took the name I put in and then put in .app on the end. Um, let's see, I got to take the magnifier off for a moment. The min required SDK, I'll move up to ice cream sandwich again. Target and compile with her 19. Everything else is the same. I'll say next. And now you see everything keeps, you know, this always changes when every time I download a new Android Studio or update it, you know, what, the, what it looks like here. Now we've got graphical images to show what they're making. So there's a blank activity. There's a blank activity with a fragment in it. See, a fragment's a portion of an activity, and you could swap them in and out using something called a fragment transaction on a fragment manager. Here's an empty activity like the one I did on the other side. Here's the full screen. Here's a Google Maps activity, which would bring in the uh, Google services as well. And then here's a Google Play services activity. This time I'll use the 
blank one rather than the empty one so that I can actually have the menu and callbacks and everything just to give you an idea what they look like. So I'll select that and say next. And now again they say, oh, let's default the activity name to main activity and the default layout to activity underscore main. And I'll say finish. And let me make this full screen as well. And if you are an IntelliJ person, this all looks quite familiar. There's the project, hello, Gradle Summit AS. There's the app folder underneath it. There's my source folder inside with main Java. Inside of main Java is my package and my activity. There's also the res folder. So already, remember the resource folder in the other one was at top level, and now it's under the source folder. So they have redone the layout. Uh, there's drawables, and here's, a, here's the layout folder with my activity main, and more and more. And below that, you'll see I have this external there's settings.gradle. Now let me see if I can modify the font on this. And what I'll do is I will switch to, uh, oh wait a minute, got the wrong one. Uh, let's do this font. And here is my uh, font size and I want to change it to 24 at least. There, readable. Good enough, anyway. <laughs> okay. And you see in the settings file, they're saying include colon app. That's the child project, the app project. And here is the build file at the top level, build.gradle. And now you can see there's the build script again. Now we're up to version 0.11.plus. I think the current version is dot one. And below that, I have almost nothing else. See, the Eclipse one had all that stuff to map things. Here, we're using all the defaults. We're under source, main Java, source, Android test Java, et cetera. All projects, of course, is the Gradle multi-project build way of saying, in all the sub-projects and the top-level projects, should I need it, we're using the Maven Central repository. So that will be part of all the child projects. Here's the Gradle build in the app folder in the app folder. So of course they could just apply the plugin because the build script was at the top level. There are the version values of compile SDK version and build tools version. Now what I, one of the things I didn't show you on the other one was that in every Android application there's an XML file called the Android manifest. The manifest lists permissions that you need. It, it puts in the default package which is used by the Google Play Store to know when things are unique. It lists the minimum and compile SDK versions, et cetera. So one of the things that has changed is instead of living off of this XML file, which has all the activities and everything in it, now a lot of that information is set in the Gradle build. And in fact, if you use both, if you have the XML and the Gradle build, the Gradle build wins, okay, that one's ahead of it, but it's best not to use both if you can avoid it, you know, because it's that means if the Gradle build wins, then the XML files is deceiving you. It's confusing. So when you import a project from Eclipse, you, of course, it's going to generate things in the Gradle build, and it's going to have the XML, and it'll warn you right away. Hey, wait a minute! You might not want to have those settings in the Android manifest because it may confuse things. If you plan to only edit the project with Android Studio or use Gradle at the command line, then that's a good idea. If you ever plan to go back to Eclipse, you may not want to be quite so eager to get rid of the duplication. Okay? So it's a little bit awkward to deal with both at the same time. If you have some members of your team that are on Android Studio and some on Eclipse, that can lead to some confusion at some point. Okay, what else is in here? Compile SDK, build tools version as well. And by the way, some of these properties can be extracted and put in properties files. Some of them can be assigned on the command line. You have a whole range of choices because now you're in Groovy. You know, now you're not trying to code in XML. So you can actually use the, those extra features. The default config, now this is another change that just happened within the last month, is that up until then it was all called uh, pro package name. Everything was a package name, and that's what was based on in the Google Play Store and everything. Now they're calling it application ID. If I imported a project from Eclipse, it would do the conversion for me, but this is what the result would look like. And there's that, see, that is the package name that I declared in the wizard. 
We also have min SDK, target SDK. Now version and version name, version code and version name. Again, those are freed for you to, mod to uh, modify. Those are not used for anything except your own internal measurements. That's for your own purposes to say this is version 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and a version name 2.1, 2.3, 0.5, whatever you like to put in there. That's up to you. Now then we get a very important section which I'll talk more about later called build types. One of the difficulties in the Eclipse system is that if you wanted to make a debug build as opposed to a release build, there's no way to easily change it in the Eclipse project structure. And if there is, you can only do one at a time. You can't say, oh, sometimes I want to do one and sometimes I want to do the other. And hey, build both APKs when you need it. Each build type will correspond to an APK. There are two default build types. And this is in the slides, by the way. Two default build types, one called debug and one called release. You can add your own. You can make any custom name you want for the build type. If you have five different build types, that's purely up to you. And the idea is that in the build types, you're basically taking everything in the default config and then adding additional properties. This one's saying that on the release build, we have a place for our ProGuard file in case you, for those who are not an Android person, this is basically a way of uh, compressing and I keep wanting to use the word mungifying your code, you know, to make it a bit more or a bit less easy to de reverse engineer should you wish to do that. It's like the JavaScript minification mechanisms. At any rate, this is the one that would have the rules in it they want to follow. And then this is saying, oh, if I want to run it, I would change that property to true. Now, again, this is Gradle DSL. So these are, in fact, method calls. This is, in fact, their domain-specific language. I guess I should do the DSL jokes real quick, right? Uh, Java is a DSL for generating stack traces. Uh, JavaScript is a DSL for detecting browser bugs. And, and uh, Maven is a DSL for downloading the internet. Yeah. Now, of course, we know Gradle, we download the internet too, but still, it's a better joke for them. At any rate, there are the properties inside here, and this is part of the DSL. One of the features of Android Studio, by the way, is if I go to the project properties, there's my SDK location. I didn't, see, as I say, I didn't use the one that came with the bundle. I did a brew install, and therefore my SDK is at a different place on my disk. The project is specifying here the Gradle version and the plugin version, and the plugin repository and the library repository are both using Maven Central. And then under app here, you could see various settings that I could set. And if I modify these, it, this is a GUI on top of that Gradle build file. So at the top here, I have properties. I have the ability to put in a digital signature. I'll show you that later. I have flavors, which we'll get to. And there's the build types one. And you can see by default, I have a release build and a debug build. And it's showing all the different properties you could set. Is it debuggable? Does it use JNI? Where's the signing config file? Render script stuff, whether to run ProGuard or not. There's the, I can put on suffixes on the ID and the version name for each build type. This allows you to deploy both to the same device at the same time and therefore try out one versus the other. That's one of the nice features of this. Okay, uh, the other piece up here is dependencies. And right now, let me show you that inside the actual file here. Uh, here are my dependencies at the bottom. And they defaulted by saying we have a compiled dependency, the file tree starting in the libs folder, including all the jar files underneath it. In the Eclipse structure of an Android application, if you want to add in third-party jar files, you can do it, but not as part of your build process. What you do is you take the jar files and physically copy them to the libs folder, or the lib folder is actually what it is over there. And then in Eclipse, you have to go and set the uh, build path to use that folder, to use the jar files in there as part of your overall dependencies so that you can code to those guys as well. I'm going to, I'm going to get away from this Hello World app shortly and show you an app that has still very small, very simple, but has a lot of these different features in it, just to make it a little bit easier to follow. Okay? But at any rate, because we're in Gradle now, we can actually put in a dependencies block and list local dependencies like this, or we could say library dependencies if we're dependent on something else, or we can use our normal dependencies 
from Maven Central or Maven Local or any IV repository, anything you like. And that's what I'm going to illustrate later. So the, the project properties showed you those tabs along the top. Those are for people who don't like using directly editing Gradle. I expect there'll be a lot of Android programmers who are suddenly faced with having to deal with Gradle and don't know Gradle, don't know Groovy, who are going to want to go through the GUI to do everything. And then there's probably the rest of us who go, boy, it's easy enough just to edit this file. Control space works pretty well in here. It's not perfect, but there's a lot of good assist that happens up, a lot of good code assist in here as well. And there's our basic structure. OK. We also have a Gradle.properties file as well, which you could, for example, set, use to set the JVM memory settings if you needed to, or to run in parallel if you have. What it can do is it can run multiple property, multiple subprojects in parallel. At least it could do the build that way. Now, I didn't really change anything, but because I clicked on it, IntelliJ is saying, hey, you should synchronize now. It looks like you modified something. So even though I didn't, just to make the IDE happy, I'll click on that, and it's available. Now, there's a window over here called Gradle. And in Gradle, this window, you see it says there's the project name. And underneath the project name, these are all the default tasks that are available in this project. Now, I can work with it in the IDE, but if I want, I can also do this in the command prompt. If I go to, this is uh, hello, Gradle Summit. And if I go uh, gradle.tasks, then you see it's going through both subprojects and giving me all of these tasks here. Android dependencies is if one Android, that has to do with dependencies on Android related things, not your regular library dependencies. Signing report I'll show a little bit later. That's how to check the jar signatures and everything, the signing mechanisms. And then assemble, and notice there's an assemble for each of the build types. Assemble debug, assemble release. When we talk later about flavors, there'll be an assemble and a build and an install for each of those two. And if we did variants, then a variant is a combination of a flavor and a build type. And then we'd have assembles and everything for those as well. It gets very complicated very fast, but it, on the other hand, it's very powerful as well. It gives you a lot of capabilities. There's your build, there's the clean, and then uh, down here, there are the install and, and something that we desperately need in the Eclipse side, which we don't have, which is uninstall tasks. There's no way to run an Android project in Eclipse without either an emulator running or a connected device. Every time you play around with this thing, you have to have something that you're running on. Even the tests, the tests, they, they call them unit tests, and they're not. They're integration tests. I mean, because you actually have to have an emulator or a connected device. Uh, you could argue certain unit tests, aspects of them, but I think of it as an integration test. And it's easy to deploy to a device and to experiment with the device. That's also, by the way, why there's no real hot code replaced. You can't just modify a file and click do it again. You actually have to rebuild it and redeploy it. The reason this happens is because, again, we're not really Java. We're, we're Java, which generates byte codes, and then the Android tools take those byte codes and dexify them. They turn them into dex files, D-E-X, because we're running on a Dalvik virtual machine, DVM, not a Java virtual machine. So there's an additional processing step that has to happen, which kind of kills the whole idea of a hot code replace. You've got to rebuild the DEX files and the APK and everything and deploy it. And by the way, even the debug APK is signed. It's just there's a default signature, and it's already built in. There's a default name and, and store password and everything, and we don't even see it. But if you look it up in the docs, they have it, or if you run that store. In fact, right now, if I say uh, it, Gradle, uh, Signature, let me just say, make sure I get the right name. Yes, yeah, signing report. And remember, in Gradle, you can abbreviate. You know, if you, as long as it's unique, you can just put in the task name and it'll show you. And you see here, I have a debug mechanism using the built in debug.keystore that goes in your home folder by default. And there's the Android debug key is the alias. There's a store password. I think it's uh, actually it's not showing that. At least that's good. There's the MD5 hash and the SHA-1 and all those different pieces. Now, by the way, before I go on, notice 
if I'm looking at the installs here, there's an install uh, debug. Oh, there is an uh, there's no there's an uninstall release. There's no install release. The reason there's no install release is because I haven't provided the signing information yet. You have to provide the key store and, the, and generate the certificate and everything. Once you tell it all that, then you'll have an, an install release task in there, which will build the file using the, the release settings and sign it and generate that APK and can deploy it to the device that way. Okay. So here's your whole list, and I love this uninstall all because, as I say, on the Eclipse side, there's no easy way to do that. You go inside the emulator and you uninstall, you know, just like you would on a regular device, which is tedious and annoying. But okay, so be it. Now I could run uninstall all or individual ones, and the Gradle build will take care of that for me. So nobody talks about that as a feature, but I really like it. Okay. Then down here you can also run lint and then this check is important but the really important one is connected check. In a regular Java project when you run a Gradle build it builds the source code, it compiles the tests and it executes the tests and generates your nice uh, output page, your HTML report for all the tests. That doesn't happen on Android, partly because you can't even run tests on Android unless you've got a connected device. or an, uh, an emulator running. So instead you run connected check inside either inside Android Studio or from the command prompt and that's what will say okay now as part of the overall acyclic graph you know we'll run the test the, the connected check will run the test tasks on all the connected devices at the same time. Now the device check here is the one that's supposed to be used for continuous integration servers, so at least we have some approach to that as well. I'm just going to show you the connected check. And then Android Lint, by the way, this is another very nice feature of the Android SDK. Android Lint gives you excellent information about your code quality and even picks up an awful lot of Java issues in addition to basic Android issues as well. I've been very impressed with that, and that runs just fine under Eclipse as well. It's just here, the, there are the actual tasks if you decide to trigger it from Gradle. Okay? Now with all that in mind, now let me switch up. I was just going to show you here. This is that huge list of available tasks. And this is not showing just those few that we saw. It's showing all of the under the hood tasks too. That would be shown from the command line if I put the dash dash all. If I say Gradle task dash dash all, then I'd see all of these, not just the ones they're expecting me to run from the command line. You can double click on any of these in Android Studio and run Gradle from within here as well. So either way is perfectly fine. All right, enough with the hello world example. Let me show you the app that I want to highlight uh, here. Now, to explain this guy, I have to show you that, like most of my favorite examples, it starts with a joke. So here's a website called the Internet Chuck Norris Database, ICNDB. Chuck Norris once ordered a Big Mac at Burger King and got one, OK? It is a RESTful web service. If I go to the API here, they show there's a base URL of api.icndb.com. And what you get back when you send a GET request, it's only GET request. There's no post, put, or delete. But what you get back is a JSON object. And the JSON object shows a type and a value. The type is success, so I just ignore, you know, I don't need that. I just assume it's success. The value is a nested JSON object that has an ID and then a joke. Time waits for no man unless that man is Chuck Norris. Okay. Now, you can change the first name and last name, and I'm going to, I'm going to demonstrate that for my uh, different build types. I'm not going to get into the whole flavors and everything. For the flavors and the variants, I'm going to use one of the samples that, comes, that you can download just to illustrate it, because as I say, that gets very complicated very fast. You know, so it's better just I'll just illustrate it. But here I want to show you an app. Now, I don't want to just go to the regular random ones, because a lot of those aren't really suitable for public consumption. You know? Uh, so instead, I'm going to restrict it to, limit it to the nerdy jokes, which are much better. Okay? So what I want to show you is an Android app that assembles this URL, 
does a GET request to go to this website, downloads the JSON data, and then transforms the JSON data into an object, and then you pull a value off of the object. I just want to grab the joke out of it, and updates the app itself with this. Now, if you read the Android literature, if you read the books on Android and everything, then you find out, first of all, Android has in its SDK built right in a version of Apache's HTTP client project. They also have built in an org.json package so that you can build JSON objects and serialize JSON objects. They have a JSON reader and a JSON writer. They have all this stuff. I'm not going to use any of that. I find that actually more complicated and tedious than what I want to do. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to use a project called Spring Android. You ever hear of this? Now, when you hear the word Spring, you immediately go, they're putting a dependency injection container on a phone? Seriously? That's not what this is about. Now, Google does, by the way. Google Juice has a version to put one, a dependency injection container on a device. That's not what I'm after. Spring Android only has two components to it. One is a REST template. The REST template will perform get post puts and deletes and then take the results and populate an object with them. And the other component is the authentication module to do OAuth or OAuth2 or any other authentication you need. I don't need that. This is a public website, perfectly open. Uh, in fact, it only supports GET requests. Some people I know refer to that, therefore, as a GET full web service. And I suppose if it's stateless, does that make it a forgetful web service? Yeah, I know. But there's just not many people I can use that gag on, OK? So I'm going to use Spring Android to set up the REST template to access the web service. And then you see the JSON object I'm looking at is not very complicated. I just built a Java class to map to it just where the attributes map to the names of those properties in the JSON object and assemble it and then I pull the value off and I update the GUI. The other somewhat interesting part of this app, which I'll show you in a moment, is that in order to access a website off, off the application, you're not supposed to be on the UI thread. You have to get off the UI thread to do any significant performance, including large database queries and everything. But then to update the UI, you have to get back on the UI thread as well. Now, there's many ways to do this, but Android provides a special class called an async task. And an async task has a couple of callback methods, one of which puts you automatically off of the UI thread to do the work, and then one of which, when you're done, puts you back on the UI thread so you can update this. And I'm just going to show you the whole thing, just to give you an idea what it looks like. OK? So that's the, the bottom line. Let me build this now. So oops, wrong one. Here's Android Studio. Let me make this full screen. And in my project, yes, I have my key promoter turned on. I keep, it's going to drive me crazy at some point. I have my main activity. But usually, when I'm looking at an application, an Android app that I've never looked at before, then I start off with the manifest because the manifest here, first of all, shows the permission I need. I need internet permission to go off site and look at this. And then inside the application, in addition to setting some icons and themes and everything, it lists every single activity. Every activity you create must show up in the manifest. And the only activity I have is this main activity. The dot here means put it on the end of the package structure there. And then here is an intent filter, which is the category of launcher main. In other words, this one activity is the so-called launcher activity, the one that starts up when I double click on the icon on my phone. Okay? So whenever I'm looking at a brand new app I've never seen before, I don't just assume they called it main activity. I go look for the launcher activity inside of the manifest. Now this is telling me that the launcher activity is this main activity. And then I look in the main activity in the onCreate method and look for the layout file, activity main here. And if I look at activity main, and I think I can control click on that, then here's what the thing looks like. Now, it's called the Internet Carlos Ray database for a reason. Uh, I built this app, or a much simpler version of this app, roughly a year ago. And I use it on no fluff, no just stuff presentations just to show people how to do an async task, et cetera. And I published it to the Google Play Store with a little Chuck Norris icon. I called it the ICNDB app. And a few months later, I received an email from Patent Boggs LLP 
the attorneys for Mr. Carlos Ray, quote, Chuck Norris, saying that I was impinging on his intellectual property and to remove my app. And I was like, I'm consuming data from a public website and I'm not selling anything and it's just the source code's available. What am I doing wrong? And so I ignored it. So of course, about a week later, Google Play disabled my app. At which point I got annoyed and I stood for, usually I'm much too much of a coward to do anything about that, but this time I decided to rewrite the app as the Internet Carlos Ray database. And now it's in the Google Play Store. You're welcome to it. I have tens of users. Okay, that's been, a, I even put Patent Box LLP on the icon, you know, and I haven't heard anything yet. So that's why it's Carlos Ray. So who, did you know that Chuck Norris's name was Carlos Ray? I had no idea. He's also worth like $70 million, according to Wikipedia. He's also 70 years old. Now, I have no doubt he could kick my ass, you know, but, but whatever, you know. <laughs> this is it. Very simple app. I, I have one activity, which has a text view on it. That's the label. And then I have a button called Get Joke. And so there's my text view, and here's my button. And the button has the text on it. Now, you see, this is one of the features of both Android Studio and IntelliJ. It looks like I've hardwired a string in here, get joke, when in reality, if I moused over that, you see it's actually an at string resource. And, in, and the IDE is simply showing me, it's following the layer of indirection to show me what the value is. Sweet, right? Uh, there's my width and height, and there's my text size and everything, and it's all ready to go. Now, to show you how the code works, and then I can show you the Gradle build file. Again, what I need is I need that REST template. So I've got some third-party libraries, and I also set it up to have two different build variants. One is the debug build, and one's the release build, so that I could change the name that I'm using as well. So here's the actual source code. First of all, this is the simple part. This is the Java class that maps to that JSON structure. I have a type and a value. Remember, value was an inner JSON object. So here's getters and setters, and then here's the inner JSON object, joke, which has an ID, a joke, and categories. I made up the data types myself, right? I mean, JSON is untyped. And the rest of this is just getters and setters. So I have provided a class that maps this, this, by the way, up here, this get joke is simply a convenience method so that once this object is populated, I could pull the joke string out of it without having to navigate to the inner class down below. Once I have a Java class that maps to the JSON structure, the rest is just using Spring Android. So here's my main activity. And at the top here, you see, there's my URL. That's the base URL. There's the limit to nerdy first name and last name. I'm using a URL template. So these are values that I can substitute in. There's the joke view itself. There's the rest template once I've instantiated. I need a reference to the async task because here's one of the things about uh, Android. If you rotate the phone, you destroy the activity. <laughs> as part of the life cycle, it destroys the activity and recreates it because you can have different layouts for different aspect orientations for portrait versus landscape, no problem. So it actually destroys it. Well, if I fire off an activity, or fire off it rather an async task that's planning to update this tree and I rotate the phone and change the tree, then it just dies. I mean, it, it doesn't stop. It actually goes, it comes back, it has nothing to update. And, he, and the user doesn't see anything. The user sees nothing. But we see a nice little stack trace or an output or whatever in the logger. Well, what they recommend, therefore, is if I keep this async task as an attribute, then inside my onStop method, I can kill it. In case somebody rotates the phone, onStop will get triggered, and I can shut it down. That's, it's just an example of how you use these callback methods to make things a little bit cleaner. Now, the async task takes three generic parameters. This first one is, are the uh, arguments, and a variable argument list. That's going to be the first name and last name that goes in here. Void is a, is a type to report on progress, how long it's, you know, how things are moving, like if you're going to move a progress bar along. This thing's so fast, I don't have to use that. And then the last one is the return type from the task. What am I getting back? I'm getting back a string. That's all I have. So here is on create. Set the content view, and then this is the mechanism you use in Android to find the various widgets. You find view by ID. There's that text view was declared as an ID in the, 
in the XML file, and here's my button. I looked up the button. I set the on click listener to be this new inner class. This joke task is going to be my subclass of async task. And I execute, and I put Hans in here, OK, just so you can see. And I also added in my JSON HTTP message converter. The purpose of that is that the MIME type coming back from the website is application slash JSON. And I want a converter that takes that and converts it to my Java class that I'm providing. I could either use Jackson or Jackson 2 or any of the other Java converters. I happen to be using Google's JSON. Okay? And I call it JSON. Okay? I know if people say JSON, but I like picturing a guy with a hockey mask and a machete while I'm cut, you know, work. At any rate. Okay, there's that on stop. Like I say, if the task is not null, cancel it. And the true here means even if you have to interrupt it. You can go ahead and cancel it. Uh, I'll come back to the menu part here. And then down in here, now it says Hans Doctor, but it's not really what I have in my file. What this is saying is get string r.string.firstName. I actually put first name and last name inside the strings.xml file, the resource. And what I'm going to show you in a moment is I put one in for debug mode and a different name in for release mode so that I can use both. Here's the task itself that's doing the work. It says template.get for object. There's the URL. These two parameters are what get plugged into the URL. And this is the class I'm trying to instantiate based on the return value. I find this a heck of a lot simpler than using HTTP gets and JSON builders and all that. This just seems simple to me. At any rate, then I just pull the joke out and return it. Now the on post, the do in background method operates off of the user interface, or the UI thread, I should say. And then the on post execute method is back on the user, uh, the uh, UI thread. So this string here means that the argument to do in background is string dot dot dot. This does the work, and this string here is the return type up here. It's also the argument to on post execute. So in on post execute, it says, go find that joke view and set the text to that. See, I'm back on the user interface thread. So it's still a pretty simple app, but it's got some interesting features to it. But here's the good part. Let me show you the Gradle build. Uh, actually, though, to prove a point, let me run it first. And what I'll do is that I will run it with the debug version, which means I'll just click on it. And I believe this will prompt me to say, there's your running emulator. If I had other emulators going too, that would be fine. If I plugged in a connected device, that would show up as well. And I'm going to say, yes, go ahead and use that emulator. And here is the emulator coming up. And if I click on Get Joke, oh, that's right. For the debug mode, I switched to Zav, who's not looking up. Won't he be surprised? Of course, anybody could read from an input stream. There you go. Is that better? OK. Or here. Uh, that, yeah, that's not too bad. Let's see. There you go. Uh, I like that one, right? I think my favorite of all time was um, Chuck Norris can, uh, in, can make a method both abstract and final. I thought that was a good one. You know. But you see how quick it is? That's the async task, accessing the website, pulling down the data. And then how am I doing that where I have a different name on the different pieces? So if I go back to the Android Studio part here, first of all, let me look at the build files. So let me uh, do an open. And if I do a build.gradle, this one is the top level one. And at the top level one, it's the same build script as before. Repositories are Maven Central. Nothing special there because I don't have any library projects underneath or anything like that. I'm just using the normal build here. The other one is the one under the actual app. And of course, I just switched to the one I didn't want. Uh, there it is. And now this is the one with the interesting part in it. Now, first of all, what you see at the top here is I've added an additional Maven repository. That's because that's where the Spring temp the REST template lives. The Spring Android project is at that location. So this is going to merge with the top level repositories. So it'll use Maven Central if I need it, and then this one if I can't find it. Okay? And you could add in as many as you want. You can use flat file directories. You can use IV repositories. You can Maven Local, Maven Central, everything. These are defaults, compile SDK, build tools version. Now, in, when I did this before, 
some of the files that I'm going to bring in, some of the libraries, pardon me, that I'm bringing in for the uh, Spring Android project have notices in them and licenses in them. And in fact, both of them have notices and both have licenses and they would conflict and that would cause problems with my build. So here I have the option when packaging to exclude them. Took them right out. Default config, nothing we haven't seen before. Everything exactly like that. Now here's the signing configs. This is so I can do a release build as well. So the store file, I put the file in the root of the app project. Not the top level, but in the app project right below it. I generated, I used the key tool to generate it, called it ICNDB. There's the alias, there's the password for the store, there's the password for the uh, actual key. Now, of course, what some people are immediately going, wait a minute, passwords in clear text? That can't be a good thing. There are plenty of alternative ways to do that. You can put it as system properties and have them read system properties. You can put them in a separate file that's imported and you don't check into source code control. You can have the user, have the app prompt you for them. You can even have it prompt the user to plug in the, not the user user, but in, in the uh, developer, have the prompt the developer for them. So there's lots of alternatives. I'm just keeping it simple here. And besides, that's part of the joke, right? You know. The, the jokes don't get that good. I mean, they're all right, you know, so enjoy them while you got them. At any rate, here's the build types. And remember, I had that ProGuard stuff. Here I'm saying in the release version, use this signing configs.release configuration when I build a release version. The debug version, I'm not doing a signing. I'm, I'm just going with the default debug one. And you can see here, though, you could specify an app application ID suffix and a version name suffix. Again, the purpose of that is so I can deploy both apps on the same device if I wanted to. I, I don't have any product flavors actually, but that would come later. Here are the dependencies. There's the one that came in at first. Here's the Spring REST template. Here's the uh, Spring Android Core, which this requires. There's Google JSON. And then also, uh, I may not get a chance to show it to you, but I put in some testing as well. And I'm using uh, Robotium for that. Anybody use that before? Makes, yeah, makes testing of a GUI so much simpler because you could just find a button and click on it and check for fields and everything. Very, very nice mechanism there. Uh, so that's all in there. So now the only other thing I did is that if you take a look at the project structure here, you will see that in addition to my normal source main Java with the res folder underneath it, I also have a source debug with the res folder values and strings.xml. And see, this is the one with Zav in it. Whereas the one under main, the one under main is the one with Hans in it. So that whichever one I deploy, the debug one or the, or the release one, that's the one that will use the, va it'll use the values in the corresponding file, okay? Now, since time is getting short, let me go back to the slides and show you how much of this we've covered and then give you some guides to a few more things as well. So uh, actually, let's go that way. So all right, there's the developer page. There's the Eclipse stuff with the, with the download. Uh, Eclipse does not support Gradle in any active way, as I mentioned, but you can generate a build file, although, again, they don't even recommend it anymore. It's better just to import the Eclipse project. Uh, of course, you always have to start off with why Gradle, at which point I said, duh, you know. I mean, this is a Gradle conference. You, you know why, you know. Uh, it's got all these nice capabilities. I'm not going to take time for that. Uh, there's the Android Studio link, should you choose to grab it based on IntelliJ, uses Gradle, and they say it's early beta, beware of bugs and unsupported features, but I am far less worried about that than I was even three months ago. I mean, in the last six months, this thing, the, the stability and the quality have improved by leaps and bounds. If you are starting with it now, I think you will be fine. Now, there will be breaking changes. We're pre 1.0, but so far, everything's been pretty easy to accommodate. So uh, there's the latest version I put is 0 0.6. It's very easy. Oh, by the way, one of the things that, that 0.6 helps you with, if you run the Gradle daemon, 0 0.6 takes advantage of that. So when I run Gradle builds over and over again, I get all that performance improvement. Very nice here. Uh, there's creating the app by setting the package name 
and there's the min and target SDKs, oh, sorry, there's the manifest with data which now we move into the other Gradle build files in many cases. Doesn't eliminate the manifest entirely, although it does pretty much eliminate the manifest in the test project. See in Eclipse you had to have a manifest over there too. In Android Studio it's generated for you based on the existing manifest and whatever else you put under the Android test configuration. So it becomes much simpler again. Um, now these things are set in build.gradle, overrides the XML, manifest has all this stuff in it, intent filters and services, etc. Activities are, this, are individual screens. There's the layout files in XML, the callback methods to respond, like I was using on stop to shut down my task. Uh, if you have an app that's playing music in the background, it's very nice to your users. If on pause, you stop playing the music, you know, then you could resume it and on resume if you like, that sort of thing. Uh, res is the resource folder with all these different resource types. This is the list of different resource types that you can modify, and this is how people make separate layouts for landscape versus portrait, or for different version numbers or different screen resolutions. Like uh, SW720P or 720 DPI is a um, that's a seven-inch tablet or a ten-inch tablet. Uh, 600 is the seven-inch tablet. 720 is the ten-inch tablet. The SW is shortest width. That sort of thing. There's keys and values, your layer of indirection here, and it's compiled into r.java. And now the Android plugin for Gradle uses that build script, and then you could apply the plugin. There are a few related plugins as well, like there's an Android report plugin, there's an Android library plugin as well if you're making a library project. Same build script though, just selecting which one you're using. Put in your version code and name, or you could even put it in gradle.properties, it all comes in there. Again, it assumes it's a multi-project build. Your settings.gradle will list which sub-projects you are dependent on. Uh, you get your debug and release types. Whoops, wow, I don't know why that jumped like that. Okay, there's, your, there's the configuration sections in the build file where you can customize the debug and release section here. You can add your own custom builds as well. Then we have for each of those types, you get a separate source tree. So you can think of it as a source set in Gradle. Okay? So we have a main one and a debug one and a release one. Every additional one you create gives you another source tree. There's also an Android test one for testing. You can, the XML files, I had a separate XML file under two of them, and it chose the right one. If there's a conflict, it uses the one you're on. If there's a Java class in conflict, though, that's, a, that's an error. Instead, it's better to use flavors for that. Flavors make different applications, whole separate APK, whereas build types are just, like they say, build or release, something where one's going to replace the other. You can't assemble a release until you sign it. You use the key tool. Here I ran the, the command to generate it and put in all this information and it built the key for me. So in case you wanted a sample, like I say, all this should be on the website now. Here's what the result looked like inside of the Gradle build file. Uh, the passwords can be elsewhere. See the docs, they have lots of suggestions for this. Then I added my signing config to say use that. The signing report task shows all that. Then you can evoke assemble release. Well, here's what I was about to show you, actually. Let me quickly flip to this. Inside Android Studio, I did it again, didn't I? Here's Android Studio. Here's the Gradle build over here. And what I'm going to do is I've set up, there's the install release task. Instead, I'll do the, actually, I did the install debug task when I just ran it. This time I'll do the install release task, and you'll see this is running the Gradle stuff here. And if I go back to my system here, uh-oh, I don't think it did it. Oh, what that did is it installed it. It didn't execute it, okay? It just put it on the device. So what I can do here is go back, and if I go, actually let me go home here, and then go to the apps, and the app should be, well, it's one of these, and I don't know which one because, again, they have the same name, so I'll just find out the hard way. Yeah, see, there's the one with Hans, see? That's not a funny one. Let's, I want a funny one. Uh, that's okay. Okay, that's not bad, you know. Uh, can instantiate an interface? That's another good one, you know. 
So at any rate, that's the mechanism you could use to play with the Gradle part in order to install or, de or deploy whichever one you want. Now for testing, again, since we don't have time, I'm not going to show it to you, but I will tell you what I have. What you do is that this is the default name for the source tree for tests. So it's a source set again, Android test and dot Java, and then you build your tests however you like, and you use uh, compile Android test is where the dependencies go. And again, as I had it here in my Gradle build file, I think I wrote it wrong in the slide. It's Android test compile. There's the jar file needed only for testing and not for anything else. And then you run it by running connected check. And I could, you know, as a matter of fact, while we're talking, just I could fire that up. Uh, I only have one emulator on at the moment, so it won't be quite as dramatic. But if I go to, um, uh, let's see, back to uh, ICNDB, and I go Gradle connected check, then it's going to run through all the phases and hit the, keep going, the connected Android test stage. Now, if I had, I plan to have, just ran out of time, if I had multiple devices and a connected device on there, it would test it on all of them. And yeah, every once in a while, I run into an issue. It probably fell asleep or something. Uh, right now, I have a test in there just to find the joke button and click it. And every once in a while, it doesn't find it for some reason. But at any rate, if I look at the report, there's the report. And it's got a failed test and everything. But I've done this before, and it ran just fine with, uh, with multiple versions of this. Okay. The part we didn't get to talk about, let me at least summarize. You could specify flavors. A flavor is a separate version of the same app. And a typical example would be free and paid versions of the app. But you could determine as many as you want. And then a variant is a combination of a build type and a flavor. So here, for example, free and debug, or free and release, paid and debug, paid and release. You can have them all, build them all up, and have them all available however you want. The code gets a little complicated, but there are samples. And that's what I want to show you in a minute. So I say there's samples. Let me show you where to get this, and this is where I'll stop. In case you're interested in that Spring Android part, there it is. And here's the references. This is the link you want. The, the link to the new build system, and then there's a user guide underneath it. On this page with the new build system at the bottom is a zip of a whole bunch of samples. The latest version is 0.10 of the Android plugin. I have downloaded those, and you can look at all the projects in there and see different mechanisms. There is a section of the regular Android developer guide on Android Studio, which talks about Gradle as well. It's a little dated, but it's not bad. This is actually an actual real live reason to go to Google Plus, you know, <laughs> uh, is that the Android developers group over there is very active and lets you know what's going on. And by the way, Zav's over there and his, his posts are always worth taking a look at. And finally, if you're interested in the, if you've got questions and problems, in addition to that, there's an ADT dev group on Google Groups. And even though we're not really on ADT anymore, the same group is being used to answer questions about all that stuff. So then just to finish with the jokes, you know, shouldn't data run on Android? Ha, 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 you know. Or even better, uh, I'm calling for my new Android smartphone. Yes, it even includes unlimited data. Yes. Please don't take that out on me on the evals, although I will understand if you do. Um, I will be happy to hang out if you have any questions or comments or better jokes than these. Zav is here as well, although I don't know how long he can stay. Uh, but just thank you very much for coming.